George Orwell led a fascinating life that's been dramatised more than once with the help of the actor Ronald Pickup who played him for the BBC. Today I'm going to tell you about the best of the Orwell biopics, arguably. Our story begins in the early to mid 1980s. The real life year of 1984 is coming up and it's become a media talking point, a cliche in fact. How is this year going to compare to the book that Orwell wrote? In the summer of 1983, the venerable American newscaster Walter Cronkite devoted a whole show to this. In Britain, the BBC arts documentary series Arena was talking to people who'd known him for what would turn out to be a five-part series shown over the 1983-84 New Year period. Now this was helped immeasurably by the first really comprehensive biography by Bernard Crick that had come out in 1980. But in this video series I want to concentrate on the biopics, the dramas, and there were two rival productions going on. Now by a roundabout route that didn't start as a drama, the BBC Scotland music and arts producer Norman McCandlish, who was based in Glasgow, was putting together a TV play by the highly respected scriptwriter Alan Plater. The play's name was The Crystal Spirit, Orwell on Jura, and it would focus on the summers of 1946, 47 and 48, when Orwell retreated to a remote farmhouse on a Hebridean island to write 1984, shortly before he died. Meanwhile, the commercial company Granada was making The Road to 1984, starring James Fox, a TV movie that took a much more broad overview of his life, and I'll be coming to that in my next video. So let's get back to The Crystal Spirit. Uh, the title, incidentally, comes from a line of poetry that Orwell wrote about the Spanish Civil War. Early on in talks with his director, John Glenister, McCandlish had the idea of casting John Cleese as Orwell. The Monty Python and Faulty Towers star certainly looked like Orwell. He was tall like Orwell was. Uh, but they thought, well, he's known for comedy, isn't he? And if he puts a foot wrong, we're going to be in trouble. So they didn't offer him the part. In the end, the role went to Ronald Pickup, who'd earned a BAFTA nomination for Best Actor. I got a call from my agent saying there's a script coming through the post from Alan Plater about George Orwell. It's about somebody called Eric Blair, so don't get confused, uh, she said. And uh, it arrived. Um, this wonderful script about somebody, I realised, because I was ignorant of what he was called, which was George Orwell, Eric Blair, this remarkable character, fascinating, it just leapt off the page. I mean, it was Alan at his most incredibly precise and forensic and, and imaginative. I mean, there he was, this working class lad from Hull, but he knew how to write about the posh people brilliantly. In researching the play, Alan Plater spent some time on the island of Jura talking to people who'd known Orwell, and they'd tell him things like this that beneath his stern exterior he often seemed amused and sometimes he'd be talking and he'd stop in mid-sentence, he'd roll a cigarette and then he'd carry on where he left off. Now little details like this, they were meat and drink to pick up. I, I knew I wanted to kill to do this thing. It was for just a month with virtually no money and I say that not because it should have been more money, although one could always be happy with more money. It was simply something you knew you had to do even if it was going to be no money. It had this feel of something very special about it. No footage of Orwell speaking exists. The best we have is a film of him playing the Eton Wall game as a teenager. And even though he was a World War II propagandist for BBC Radio, there's no known recording of his voice. Apart from Alan's fantastic script, it was the key for me to finding how to play him in a way because he he, he found a dis, this 
incredibly articulate, brilliant man, found it very difficult and painful to talk because of his TB and because he'd been wounded in the throat uh, during the Spanish Civil War. And I happened to find out that Michael Mayer, who I knew and worked with, the wonderful translator and abridger of Ibsen and Strindberg, knew him from a, a literary club where they all used to meet together, many of the great names of the literary world at that time. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not trying to be in character. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, I rang him up saying, look, I hear you knew George Orwell, I'm going to ask you, could you tell me what, what he sounded like? Because obviously there was something very distinctive about him. And he said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, he said it was very, it was very strange being with, with George, with Eric Blair. Because he didn't seem sometimes to, to, to want to talk. And uh, anything he said was very elliptical and to the point and brilliant. But he never said more than was necessary. And of course, we all realised that it was partly because of his, his, his illness. He was, he was by then severely tubercular. But also he'd been wounded in the throat in, uh, in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. And it gave him, uh, and I won't attempt now to do what I did then because it was uh, something you played around with when you were shooting during the daytime. I'm talking as me now, not Michael Nair. It was important to get this dried, scraped feeling. And Michael did it for me over the phone. And it was, I'm so glad I rang him because it was, it wasn't a brilliant imitation, but and he said, no, I, I, I'm not an actor, I can't possibly do it. But he gave me this feeling of it being a sound that was somehow scraped from somewhere. And it, it said everything. I'm, I'm very grateful to dear old Michael May, apart from anything else. So. Everyone I've spoken to says the shoot, which was all on location, was an absolute dream. The weather was incredible. The pay was appalling for an actor of Pickup's calibre, but they all did it because the script was so marvellous. Point number one, it was beautiful weather. Um, I think, I mean, the, the only problem about shooting the film in any truthful way was that I think we only had one day's rain. And, I mean, we really needed something because it looked as if he'd retired to the Bermuda or somewhere, you know, somewhere exotic and sunny. Plus the fact that we were doing something where there was never any, which is always the important thing, you can be having all of those wonderful physical extras in a film, but um, if it's a difficult film, if it's a film where you know the script isn't working and that, it, that can all be miserable, but this wasn't. It was always a joy, really. It was idyllic in that sense. It was always a joy to just get up in the morning and go and do another scene in which you didn't have to, you, all you wanted to do was just know that you could make it as good as possible and even better. The scenes just always fell into place. Wonderful. What every actor wants, whatever director wants. That was the summer of 83. The play was shown on December the 20th, much to the annoyance of all the people who worked on it because they just felt that it was lost in the Christmas programming. It's a wonderful view. Light looking through a window pane. I'm sorry? Uh, it's a quotation from my own work. The last refuge of a desperate middle-aged writer. It was rapturously received by critics and was shortlisted for Best Single Television Drama at the BAFTAs. But you know what, it's never been re-screened, it's never been released commercially on video or DVD. They could bring it out on Blu-ray because it was all shot on film and it would look spectacular. John Glenister, the director, is very exercised about this because he's so proud of it. Um, but from what I've heard, there may be an issue with the rights because it was a co-production with a German company. I've seen it at the British Film Institute's Media Tech, which is a free screening service. It's a fantastic play. It's wise, it's witty, it's low-key, it's lyrical. It's beautifully directed and acted, and Orwell is depicted as a difficult man, stubborn, sometimes rude with his neighbours. Um, 
But always active though, because who wants to watch a play about a man sitting at a typewriter? He brought a man who I knew very little about other than the fact that he'd written 1984 on the farm and some wonderful essays, some of which I'd read. It was a fully rounded character about a man, a very deeply sick man who decided to take himself off, off to an island where he shouldn't have probably gone anywhere because it was not good for his health. He was obsessed with activity. He was, you could tell what can, comes out of the script. When you first read it, he's always doing things. Yes, he's writing in this feral way. He's smoking manically. But he is also skinning rabbits. He's catching them and skinning them. He's gardening. He's looking after the place. And you get this extraordinary picture of a man who, he's on the motorbike, which I, because I'm not very skilled at it, I nearly <laughs> fell off. And he was, of course, very brilliant at it because he'd been in the, by then, in the Spanish Civil War. He was an active man, so he was this kind of physically heroic character in many ways, being dragged down by this horrible disease and this desperately sore throat so that he couldn't even enjoy talking with the brilliance that he was able to, probably. Plato did insist that a smoker had to play the part because there are scenes of Orwell sitting in his room late at night, typing away and chain smoking. And you see, I can't do it because I don't smoke. Um, but you could also tell what, when he was dis you know, with that bit more relaxed and feeling perhaps less in pain, he was very funny man. He had this wonderful gallows sense of humour and rather rude to his sister and to those who loved him and whom he loved. He had that very engaging, if you like, upper class Etonian rudeness and eccentricity which is very appealing. Nobody knows quite why something like that is appealing but it is. Thank you for watching, please like and subscribe and next time it's The Road to 1984 with James Fox. I haven't come down. I'm a writer. Try to go back to sleep, Mr. Orwell. I am driven on, like all writers, by some demon one can neither resist nor understand. I am a writer.